Good morning and welcome to AXA Coral Live. We're broadcasting from the Kamabi Research Station here in Curacao. And absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Kristen Marhaver, uh, who's joining us for our expert interview this morning, uh, perhaps this afternoon, uh, <laughs> wherever you are. Um, before we, we, we come on to sort of learning more about your fascinating research and, and how you got into this role, uh, a couple of shout outs. Um, so we have the Year 8 Oak Geography students from Collinson Grammar School in Devon and Class 70 at Boulder Academy in Isleworth, London. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. I think we, we do have schools from, I think, about seven different countries, uh, but those are the shout outs um, we've had submitted for this session. Thank you so much for joining us. As you may already know, this is our first day of Coral Live. And today's focus is really on the coral polyp, um, the little animal that makes the amazing reef. Uh, on Wednesday, we're looking at the wider ecosystem, looking at a few huge food webs and chains uh, before moving on to some of the impacts um, that are happening, um, human impacts on the reef on Friday with a live <laughs> investigation, ocean acidification in a cup and dissolving corals in vinegar. <laughs> I'm not, I won't be here for that one. <laughs> uh, then taking us into next week, uh, we're going deeper on the reef um, on Tuesday. And then finally looking at some adaptation uh, and maybe a little bit of genetics on Thursday. So do tune in on our other days as well. But for now, first day, the coral polyp. First day, coral polyp. <laughs> I volunteered to do this one because I want to talk about corals all the time. Fantastic. So... You are a marine biologist here at Carmarthen. What, what does that what does that mean? What does that mean? That's uh, that's a big question. Being a marine biologist these days now is can be 20 different kinds of jobs, but my version of, of being a marine biologist is really being a field biologist who also does work in the laboratory, and I focus my work on understanding how corals grow and especially how they reproduce and make babies. Wow. So how they and and we we talk about corals. I mean, this this is this is a sort of a rock. Corals aren't rocks. They're animals. This is this, <laughs> right. let's go back to basics here. Right. Exactly. What, 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 what is coral? <laughs> what is coral? A friend of mine likes to say they're an animal, a plant, and a rock. Wow. But really, they're an animal. So okay. some of the students that are participating in Coral Life built their own coral polyp this morning. But we can show you some examples of what coral polyps look like, and some examples of the rocks they make, and we can show you an example of the, the oh. algae that lives in their oh. skin. Wow. Well, we can look at the color of that. So uh, the very basic, the very beginning, okay. coral is just a little mouth. I guess we can close, show it really close. It's a little mouth and a little digestive system, and then it's got underneath its digestive system it's making a skeleton and then from each mouth around each mouth it has a bunch of tentacles so that's sort of the basic unit of a coral if my human body in a coral would be one little polyp like that but then the crazy thing about corals is while they're building the rock underneath themselves they're also making copies of themselves so that would be as if I sat here and then I made a copy of me and then we made two more copies of me and we just stood there making copies of ourselves over and over and over until there was a pile of me's. I mean, that sounds like science fiction. <laughs> That's I mean, pretty it, it, crazy. Is, is that cloning? <laughs> it is. It's a kind of cloning. It's basically a genetically identical copies of the same animal that started. Wow. I always tell people that example, and then I try to imagine getting along with a, a thousand versions of me and where none of us could move. <laughs> Uh, how, how would that go? <laughs> so, we would have to pick a really good spot because it would have to be shady, have to be a good breeze. We'd have to really pick carefully. And that's another secret to how corals reproduce. They have to pick a really good spot to live because once they've attached to the reef, they're, they don't usually move. So imagine you have to live with a thousand copies of yourself in one place forever. <laughs> No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and forever is forever, or, or I mean, are we talking uh, hundreds of years? For... Some corals can really live a long time. Some coral colonies can live to be a thousand years old, but we also know from genetic studies now that some coral colonies that are maybe they look like they're a hundred years old, they're pieces that have broken off of older colonies 
So some of those individuals started tens of thousands or thousands of years ago. Uh, near enough forever. Almost forever. Yeah, forever as far as I'm <laughs> concerned. <laughs> wow. So we'll show you guys a, a, an example of a live coral and the algae in its skin a little bit later on. So stay tuned. <laughs> Amazing. So we, we've got, got the coral polyp and, and then you're studying its, its reproduction or, and how it goes about making... So are, do you have male and female corals oh, or how does that's that a work? Great I question. mean, because if we're getting into what, we've got the reproduction, we've got budding, this cloning thing going on, but then yep. we've got something else going on too. Right, yes. So even though you're just in a pile of a thousand of you, you can still also find a mate and you can still reproduce if you're a coral. <laughs> so some corals, this coral, in fact, this species that I showed you just now, some colonies are male and some colonies are female. But in the case of this coral, every little polyp in this colony is male and a female at the same time. So that's pretty unusual. And then some coral species can switch from one to the other every year. Sometimes they just switch and they stay. So there's a little bit of an evolutionary game happening to decide, hmm, should I be a male or a female this spawning season? But no matter what, the whole process still starts with an egg getting fertilized, and then that egg has to turn into a baby. Made it. I, we're going to get into all, all, all the sort of samples in a little bit, but what I'm fascinated at is how how do you go from being a kid in sixth grade or eighth grade or whatever it might be, and going, I, you know, I'm really interested in science, to living on an island in the Caribbean studying coral babies? Sometimes I joke that instead of making a bunch of money and retiring to a Caribbean island, I just skip straight to going to the Caribbean island. <laughs> which is... So you too can just move somewhere and see how it goes. A lot of people think that I must have grown up living by the ocean and in love with the ocean, and I must have studied marine biology, but I actually saw the ocean for the first time when I was 13 years old. I grew up in Kansas and I never saw the ocean until I was a teenager, but I always really loved puzzles, and tiny animals, and I was very curious. I liked biology a lot. Um, I, liked, I liked writing, I liked math more. Um, so I, I had, I guess, always interest in little tiny animals and making discoveries and exploring. And then I learned how to scuba dive with, with my father, and that's because our family friend wanted to scuba dive so he could be like James Bond. So I somehow have James Bond to thank for um, my whole career. So I ended up studying, not in college I didn't study marine biology, I studied genetics and molecular biology, and I worked in a laboratory for three and a half years um, in Atlanta, Georgia. So also not by the ocean and right. also not studying marine biology, but I studied the inside workings of cells and then I studied that on corals, with corals. Ah. So they, everything kind of merged together between my curiosities and the subject I studied in school and the, the things I liked to do in my free time, like solve puzzles and go traveling. It all kind of came together. And I think the secret to that was I didn't have a plan, but I always listened to what I enjoyed doing, and I always followed my interests, and I always worked really hard, too. It sounds like, I mean... You know, students thinking you have to have this plan and you have to go to the careers office at school and they'll tell you you can be, uh, you know, I think I got told I could be a lawyer, a soldier, or a garbage truck guy. I mean, you get these random <laughs> things, you get to spat out at you from some sort of computer program. But the secret is just to work hard and follow your passion, is that? There's certainly a moment where you find, you say it's a, a subject that you you just are super passionate about, you find yourself in this moment of flow, and maybe it's doing some kind of art, or maybe it's doing computer programming, or maybe it's taking photos. You just have to listen to those little voices in your head, because that's the stuff that you want to do and your brain wants to do, and then you, you want to look for a way to apply that to the topic that you're interested in. So you have to look at the things you're doing and the interests that you have. But it's not, it's not ever so clear as you just march down one step at a time. It's really about, about finding where your talents fit, mm -hmm. and then proving to each person you work with that you're a good worker, a fun person, a go-getter, reliable, dependable. And the more, that you, the more that you show that you're a great person, 
in this step, the more people start to call each other and recommend you for things and open doors for you. So listen to the voice in your head and then prove to everyone around you that you're a good worker and a good colleague. Brilliant. And then so all that's led you from, from your dependability it has brought you to <laughs> Carl Marby Research Station. And what, 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 does a, what does a day look like for, for a research scientist? A day here can be a lot of different things. In the winter, we're working on our samples in the lab, we're studying our data, we're writing grant proposals, and in the summer, we're getting ready for coral spawning, and then in the fall, we are in an all-out crazy field operation to study coral reproduction. So tonight, we're going diving to try to find coral spawning. We're gonna to try to collect their eggs, we're gonna to try to grow those eggs in the lab, and grow the next generation of baby corals. And I have a photo of what that looks like. This is what we're looking for tonight. So now that you guys know this is one colony full of copies of the same coral, each of those mouths is spitting out about 100 eggs all in a ball. So we're going to go out and look for this species tonight and look for a chance to catch thousands and thousands of eggs from this species. And are they fertilized? There, These are not. No. These will get fertilized in the water column. Okay. But some corals release eggs that are already fertilized, and some corals release babies that are already swimming. So it's sort of a, it's hard to say, so it's hard to say any one sentence is true for every coral because there's 1,300 species of corals in the world, but this is sort of the most common way that they okay. release their eggs. So, so then we go to the lab and we start cleaning and rinsing. We collect those eggs. We rinse them, in, we get these funny kitchen containers, we rinse the eggs over and over to make them really clean. Sometimes we use these mesh filters to rinse the eggs, and eventually we get them to go all the way through development until they're swimming babies. And I brought you guys some swimming babies as well. It's not clear though if we'll be able to see these. There's, they're really, really tiny. We should say something like this is about half of a millimeter and this is a hundred eggs so they're very small when they're born okay we ready we're gonna see if we can show you guys this on the thing is if we show you guys this on the camera over the, uh, right. the big bit of coral over the big bit of coral oh there's yes. some here all right so these are coral babies this is the larval stage which sometimes people call planulae can you move it all around so can like this the oh, okay there we go they're sometimes called planulae, or we just usually call them larvae. And even though my hands are shaking, you can kind of see some of them swimming up and down. So those are just the sort of what, what looks like sort of little, little dots in the water. Little tiny dots, but they're, they're almost as smart as we are. They can sense light and colors and textures and pressure. They can smell. They can feel pressure waves, so they can basically hear. And so these little guys and girls will float through the water column of the ocean, and then they'll start to pay attention to the salinity and the temperature and the pressure and the colors and the surfaces. And then, well, you know how I told you if I was a, cop I was a thousand copies of me living in one yeah. place for the rest of my life, they have to pick one place to attach somewhere in the ocean. So that's really the most critical part of the whole life cycle of corals. If they don't pick correctly, if they don't pick a good, safe place, they might only survive for a few minutes. But if they pick the right spot, they pick a good, safe place where they can grow and be protected and eat, then they can live for hundreds of years. So that's one of the things that we study after we have done our diving and our coral babies. So, so why... why are they making bad choices, actually? Are they making bad decisions? <laughs> I mean, I was, you, I was, you sound like some parent. You're making a bad decision. I'm going to bring you into the lab and just teach you how to grow up. We just have to teach them to make smarter decisions. We are giving them a lot of really bad choices. Okay. <laughs> so normally a coral wants to live somewhere very smooth, very uh, protected from, say, getting trampled or getting chewed on. A coral wants a little bit of a hiding place, but with a little bit of sun wants good food to eat, doesn't want a lot of fertilizer or sewage or oil in the water. They need to be able to grow really slowly but still survive, which means anything fast growing can, be, can get in their way. 
So they don't, they can't do well if there's lots of algae there. They can't do well if it's very murky and silty. So if you dredge or you have soil running off a mountain and the water's all full of sand and murk, they don't do well in that situation either. So one of the reasons corals are doing kind of doing poorly now is because we're just giving them a lot of bad choices of where to live. And so by helping them out in the lab, you, you're just, you do you then take them, I mean, what, what happens after they What get, happens next? What happens next? <laughs> what next? <laughs> well, we're doing a few different things. One is trying to understand exactly what they want so we can put more of those options underwater. And so one of the things that we've been doing lately is studying the surfaces that they want to attach to. I think I left some of these next door in the lab. So we study things like would they rather live on something that's dark or pink or white? Would they rather live on something that's ceramic or limestone? And then we're also doing a, a, a new project where we're taking materials engineers from the University of Illinois and we're going to make all kinds of different surfaces for corals, made of glass and made of uh, biodegradable plastic and all different colors and all different textures. And the goal is to find out what factors we should make sure happen in the ocean and to make new surfaces for coral restoration to use. So they're more successful giving the corals good homes. Amazing. And so you're just sort of doing control studies saying, you know, which, you know, which would you prefer that we, we had out in the, in the ocean and can yep. we then make more of that either artificially because of, of you know, because we haven't right. done too well at looking after right. the real stuff or if the real bit is there. Exactly. Bring a line around and say, can we just make sure this doesn't exactly. get Exactly. Part of, part of conservation is about understanding the factors that you need for the, for the system to grow back. And then part of it is about growing the animals and trying to boost their population sizes. So do you then, I mean, is it all lab work or is, is there some sort of, is it, replanting sounds like it's a sort of forest down there but, and, <laughs> right. and it's an animal, but is, is there some sort of rest, active restoration involved? There is quite a bit of coral restoration happening on Curacao. And some of it is meant to just propagate, just to, to make more of the endangered species of corals that live on the island. But even more, even more of the focus on coral restoration here on Curacao is, is doing research to make restoration more effective. So we try to invent a bunch of tools that then we can hand off to anybody anywhere around the world, especially in the Caribbean, and then they can use to do restoration. So every time we crack a code or solve a puzzle or come up with a new method, we then tell everybody that we know how to how to have more success in their restoration. Amazing. So we've got a, we've got lots of brilliant questions that have come come in um, beforehand yes. and we've got um, quite a few I can see actually um, the live chat um, which I'm just going to pop out um, if I can. Here we go. Um, is also we've got the Dominican Republic um, on for the first time too which is um, fantastic. DR! <laughs> There is a really cool coral restoration project happening in the Dominican Republic. Just started, I think, a couple of years ago. And uh, they're starting to monitor different species. And the group doing the work there is really awesome and energetic. So I'm glad to see some, uh, some Dominican Republic students here on the stream, too. Great. Um, so we've got some questions that have been, um, we've got uh, Salwa Yunus from Cairo um, is interested in um, how can we stop, we were talking about sort of Corals not liking too much pollution. How, how, what can we do on our everyday lives to sort of think about reducing oh, water pollution? Great point. Um, Salwa, that's a good question. A lot of times when we think about pollution, we think about oil or we think about like a big steel drum sort of pouring something green and fluorescent. We think about kind of industrial pollution. But some of the worst kinds of pollution for corals are fertilizer, just from gardens, from yards, from growing crops and sewage, because it's still true that all around the world, sewage from our toilets just goes straight into the ocean. I don't know about you, but if I'm gonna sit in the ocean in one place for a thousand years, I don't wanna be in a stream of poop, and corals don't either. <laughs> so I guess I the answer to the question up. is, um, we have to do a better job keeping fertilizer and poop out of the ocean, okay. especially near coral reefs. Okay, there's fertilizer and poop away from the we may have made all the rest of the questions about poop, which I regret. Oh, we can come on to parafish later. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. We'll uh, loop back to this. 
But um, we've got Bold, Boulder Academy, um, and Miss Blomley's class. We've got uh, really well known, um asking, why does sea life inhabit coral reefs? Oh, that's a good question. That's a, a, that's a good question because corals are the most famous part of a coral reef, yeah. but there are millions and millions of species that live in the system. And I think you guys are going to talk to Kevin later today about all of the other mysterious species that live in the sand and live between corals. One of the reasons that we care about corals so much is that they build the habitat that everything else lives in. So corals build structures, they build, they build branches, they build shade, they build caverns. If you imagine a little tiny crab or a little tiny shrimp, it doesn't want to just live out in the middle of the ocean, but it could live in this little spot here, or it could live under here. A little worm lived right here on this coral skeleton. There's some... We got the Christmas tree worms, I think I saw this. The Christmas tree worms love living in corals. Let's see what else we can find in here. This is a big blocky brain coral, and somewhere underneath here is an encrusting, probably like a coral and algae, like a red algae that lived once upon a time. There's also some more worms. There's a lot of worms on coral reefs, <laughs> whether you like that or not. <laughs> it looks like there's probably some sponges and some barnacles down here. So the the reason that it's such a great place for for other animals to live is because there's so many different kinds of habitat. We call those niches, different places you can live and different jobs you can do. So it's kind of like a, a big, huge urban city where there's lots of different kinds of jobs and lots of different places to live. And then because coral reefs are mostly in hot tropical water, that also in, in contributes to the diversity because it's very warm, there's lots of sun, which means there's also lots of algae and lots of food. So you just get more species because you have so much more sun and so much more food. Amazing. Um, Namia would like question. to know why are coral reefs so colourful? Ooh. And then I like that. this temperature turning them white. How, what, what's going on there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can show you guys a, a live coral, and we can try to show you one of the reasons they're so colourful. You guys okay. ready? Yeah. I brought a whole coral. It normally lives in a tank with lots of flow, so it's not nearly as it doesn't live in this little tiny box all the time. Okay, I'm gonna bring this up here as close as Ellie tells me to. So here, you guys are looking at the side of a coral and you're looking at where the skeleton was built over years and years. This coral's probably like 10 or 15 years of coral. And then right at the top is this little tiny bit of tissue. So this coral was actually cut to do a research study and the, the skin healed back over the edge. You see how brown that is? That brown color is the inside their skin. So one of the reasons coral reefs are so colorful is that there's all kinds of different algae inside the corals doing important work for the corals, making sugars, making food. Another reason they're so colorful, let's see if you guys can see this. I have this UV light, and I'm gonna shine it right on the coral and see if we can see the fluorescent color. Look at that. You can see they've got kind of greenish mouths, and they've got this fluorescence in their skin. So they have all kinds of sunscreen pigments in their skin, basically ways to protect themselves from the sun. I think we might, we've just, the, the, the internet encouraged us to start oh, just no. in, this, in this sort of like one minute spell to go <laughs> very, very <laughs> laggy. Um, so I think we're, there we we've do it got again? a little bit of things coming on. But <laughs> I think that it looks so amazing. Um, it would be just, it'd be wonderful if person you could just, just go, go through that when you do this one more time one more time would be perfect all right we'll do it in the opposite order this time so here's the top of this coral skeleton and all of its skin which is brown because it's got algae in its skin making it sugar making it food and then all those little tiny dots of those little mouths are extra extra fluorescent oops even if you put them under a uv light they're really fluorescent they really glow and that's because they have to protect themselves from the sun. So they have all sorts of sunscreen molecules in their skin, and that protects them from basically being in the Caribbean sun for a thousand years at a time. And then if you see over here, this one is actually a piece of a sample that we collected for research, so it was cut really smooth with a saw. And the skin is healing back over the side, and then you can even see where the skeleton grew in the past. Now there's this pink coral and algae growing up over that old skeleton. And that pink color is actually pigments that that algae is also using to make its own sugar and its own food. A lot of the colors that you see on a reef are because there are all kinds of important 
pigments for doing photosynthesis, and algae for making food inside your tissue, sunscreens to protect them from the sun, and then there's all sorts of other colors on the reef that are for camouflage, or even colors of animals that they, uh, that they use to show that they're poisonous. So there's poisonous animals that are purposely really bright to sort of warn predators not to eat them or not to touch them. So it's particularly a crazy, it, sometimes it's a pretty ridiculous set of colors. Sometimes you think this is, and we've got this, this is pretty weird. We've got this relationship between this, this algae in, inside, the, inside the coral tissue, and there's a bit of a sort of breakdown when right. things get a bit warm. Right, exactly. It's, it's a very delicate balance. People think about coral symbiosis maybe as just being a very sturdy, I make you food, you give me a house, done. So the algae makes food for the coral, the coral gives the algae a house inside its tissue, but it's a lot more, it's a lot more um, nuanced than that. It's like living with a roommate or putting two pets in one place, putting a cat and a dog in one room and hoping that they get along. Sometimes they might get along, but sometimes they might not. So if the water gets warmer, or if there's a big stressful event like lots of sediment, or the water gets really cold from a big crazy rainstorm, the little delicate balance between the algae and the coral can just sort of go off. The algae might make too many sugars, and the coral might get really sick. Um, the coral might not eat enough, so the algae might not have enough amino acids to make proteins. So there's all kinds of different ways that the that one or the other can get sensitive and sick. And then the, the cooperation breaks down. Corals will spit the algae out and that's why they turn pale or bleaching or eventually they can turn completely white. And that's happening more and more because we're seeing the ocean becoming more and more extreme. More temperature extremes, more cold events, more crazy storms, sedimentation events. If that's the only problem, if that's the only thing a coral is suffering through, they can recover. But if they're already sick, there's already fertilizer, there's already pollution, there's already algae growing over them, and then the temperature warms up, then they're really wow. back on the ropes. I'm going to take, um, we're going to switch over to Jonesville Middle School. Um, Jonesville! Uh, for a couple of questions. Um, in uh, which ocean is the coral reef uh, more damaged and at risk? More damaged and at risk. Typically, anywhere you have a human, the corals are doing worse. So anywhere where people have never typically lived, the remote central Pacific, or say the Coral Sea northeast of Australia, or even islands here in the Caribbean where there's never been houses, there's never been people living, those are the places where the corals are all doing the best. And then the places that the corals are doing the worst are next to big cities, especially ones that haven't taken good care of their water quality and haven't done a good job sort of managing their fisheries and managing their reefs. I think if I had to pick one place, I would say maybe the Caribbean or the Red Sea are more stressed. That's partly because there's more humans in a smaller place and partly because that stress has been going on for longer. There's still lots of places in the Pacific that are almost untouched and still quite quite pristine, if we're allowed to use that word. Yes. Um, so, uh, one thing also coming through, and this was sort of relating to your research, um, so students at Jonesville have read that even touching the coral can kill it because of the oils on human hands. How do you um, take precautions to make sure that you don't disturb or damage the corals when you're, when you're diving oh, near them? That's a great question. That's a very uh, informed question, too. We, it's definitely true that you can hurt a coral very easily, and part of that is that they have, in some cases, super, super sharp skeletons. So if you imagine a big, soft, mushy polyp on top of the skeleton, and then you smushed it, you would really be damaging that tissue badly, and you can sometimes see the wound right away. Some corals are a little bit more sturdy, and their skeletons aren't quite as sharp, but they still have little sets all around their mouths that can damage their tissue. So when we're working with corals, the first thing we try to do is minimize the amount of coral we ever have to touch. So that means, in fact, now there's this, uh, a method that my friends are developing to uh, sample genetics without actually sampling the coral adult, but just taking a swab and just getting a little mucus off the top. You're gonna talk to Pim next week, I think. Yes. Pim is inventing this method because, oh, right. I think partly because it's not fun at all to collect corals from the ocean. 
So then if we do have to really collect a coral, what we try to do is not damage the coral, but get underneath it. So this one, once upon a time, was collected for, as, for research or for a demonstration, and you can see they basically got the whole thing, and they didn't have to cut the tissue at all or saw it or anything. They tried to just get the coral from the stalk, get the whole thing out of the water. So that's another thing that helps protect them. And then oftentimes you just have to be very, very super gentle. So if, if we have to move one or glue one or something, they can survive just being touched a tiny bit, but only very, very delicately and if nothing else is going wrong. So there's, it's kind of like, I mean, I suppose it might be like handling snakes. You're like, that doesn't look easy, but there's a couple of ways you can handle a snake safely without hurting the animal. And the same thing with, say, a baby. You know, some things are, they're very delicate in some ways, but in other ways, you know, you, you know it's going to be safe for them. And is there a case that sometimes you just need to take a physical sample as a type specimen or, or something like that, where science at the moment, our techniques demand that if we want to know what's there, we do have to get permission to take those very small. Right, things. yeah. So in many places, the, um, oh, we're getting sun in our eyeballs, so we're going to move this way. <laughs> <laughs> So in many places, there are laws about touching the corals at all. You're not allowed to touch them ever. And if, if there is a scientific study that says we really have a scientific need to sample a piece of coral, then you have to get special permission to do it. And the goal is always to do the absolute minimum amount. And you, and you think about whether the amount you're collecting is worth the, the goal that you're going to achieve. So you kind of say, if we're collecting this much coral, you know, are we going to grow back this much to make up for the damage that we did? So we're always thinking about that in the back of our minds. And I guess part of the reason that I like working with baby corals is because we get to collect the eggs, and a lot of them go back in the water, and we don't have to spend much time um, interfering with the life of the, of the big old colonies. Um, I think these questions are coming, coming in from Devon from Collison School now. Um, Devon! Uh, Sophie and Nicholas wanting to know what is the best part of your job? Oh, the best part of the job. There is a, there's a set of corals that for a long time were a mystery to almost all of us. We didn't know when they reproduced or how they made eggs or anything. And twice I've gotten to see those corals release eggs when I knew only one or two or three people in the world had ever seen that before. Wow. And that was a really, really cool feeling. I felt like, oh, now I know why people climb Everest, and now I know why people do <laughs> crazy, crazy adventures. Because when you have that moment where you have, you've seen something you never thought you would be able to see and that you know is really a rare experience, it feels really cool. It's nice. really exciting. And then every time we see coral spawn, it's so amazing and it's so weird and it's so beautiful. You always get a little, a little I mean, thrill. What does that, I mean, you, you, you showed us that photograph of, of the, the tiny eggs being released. What is the sensation? And you're diving at night? Is yep. it, why, why nighttime and what is it? What is it yeah, why, are we, why, are, why are we doing this in the dark? Most of the corals release their eggs in the dark and that's probably so that fish can't find their eggs and eat them nearly as easily. And we know that they can sense the lunar cycle, the moon cycle, and we know that they can tell what time the sun goes down. So they have calibrated their reproduction timing to the sun and the moon, which means we can go, it's the fifth day after the full moon, it's three hours and 30 minutes after sunset, and then we can go look for that coral and it's probably going to be spawning. Wow. When it happens, they sort of hold the eggs in their mouths for a few minutes so you know that a particular colony is going to release its eggs but then the colony will spit them out all at once. And then it's like you're in like New Year's or Mardi Gras or like a snowstorm. It's, there's dots everywhere and everything is swirling around. And everywhere you look with your light, there's these sort of confetti balls. It really looks like a party underwater. Wow. And especially compared to a normal night on the reef where you know, there's, there's animals out on the reef, but it's kind of quiet, it's kind of relaxed. It really looks like a like a party. Wow. <laughs> um, and another question, I think, from, from Colleton um, is, uh, what's the best reef? This is from Ollie. What's the best reef you have been to? Ollie, the best reef I have been to, there are some reefs here on Curacao at the east and west ends of the island, okay. and right around the corner onto the north shore, which is quite a bit more dangerous to dive. It's kind of dangerous to go there with a boat. But when you get around the corner and it's, 
right at the end of the island where all the water comes in. There's lots of big fish. There's tons of huge corals. There's tons of gorgonians. And then every other surface is like a bright pink coral and algae. And gorgonians oh. are the big sort of sea fans. Yeah, big sea fans. They look like bushes or like underwater <laughs> shrubs. And you see, if you see a reef like that, you kind of think, okay, there's still lots of hope because there's still reefs that look this cool. And, and we don't need a time machine to go back and see them. We still have some of them here. It means that other reefs can grow back to look like that too. You've got a few more. There's a number of questions about protecting the reef, uh -huh. um, which I'm going to leave, leave towards the end. Uh, really great to see from, from our students following the, the sort of that, that sense of care coming through. Um, but there's just a few um, coming through. There's questions um, from DPS, the school in India. DPS! Um, it, it's, uh, can, can we, what artificial methods can we use? They've come across 3D printing. Is there any sort of like, can we, can we manufacture, can we use some stem cell technology to sort of manufacture corals in a lab? I mean, Ooh. can technology start to play a role? Interesting. That's a great question. Where does technology and biotechnology come in? One of the things that I sometimes imagine when I'm doing my work, I'm trying to grow coral babies in the lab and trying to get them to grow and divide. I imagine what it would have been like for someone in South America tens of thousands of years ago to find a tomato seed and plant it and see it grow, even though that thing was inedible and disgusting and potentially poisonous. And tens of thousands of years later, you have tomatoes and you have agriculture and we can grow food that, that feeds so many more people Sometimes I imagine we're just at that very beginning where we're learning how to grow that first seed and get it to grow. So it means that we have all kinds of options available next, things like um, crossing two populations of corals to try to find stronger ones, which is exactly what we do with crops, or say, um, trying to raise them in more variable temperatures when they're juveniles so that they are more adaptable to temperature changes later on, which is something that we do also with plants. We try to make sure that a plant doesn't switch from a really shady spot to a really sunny spot really fast or it'll just wilt. So we, we can probably also kind of prepare corals for the future by helping them, by, by exposing them to certain kinds of environments when they're small. Um, and then it's kind of to be determined what happens next. I think one of the things we have to be careful of is that we don't only focus on those fancy technologies because we still have to take care of what we have. The easiest way to get corals to grow right now is to take corals that are alive and protect them. It's a way faster way to get corals than to engineer new breeds and grow them and put them out on the, in the water. But I think just like we want to be protecting a rainforest or protecting a jungle, we also want to have new methods to grow new varieties and feed more people more food. So we can kind of think about the same thing with corals. Protect what we have, and then at the same time, we want to research ways that we can help them grow back faster. Good question. Amazing. So yes, so it could be somebody's future career, but there's these twin streams of, of, of conserving and seeing what Absolutely. technology can help us. Sometimes I say, you know, you never want a heart attack, but if you have a heart attack, you certainly want that emergency room to be full of high-tech stuff. So it's better to prevent any heart attacks in the first place, but we should also be ready for, ready for the emergencies too. Amazing. Um, and just sort of going, going back um, to um, Boulder Academy in Isleworth, um, Jaden um, asked a really good question, which is, we talk about diversity in an ecosystem. What, what, what does that, what does biodiversity mean? Oh, that's a good question. That's a tough one. Jaden, good question. There is all sorts of academic geekery and debate over the definition of diversity. So you could say, <clears throat> if you have 10 different species and one of each, is that diverse? Is that more diverse than having three species but three of each? What if you have seven of one and three of another? What if you have five and five? So academics sort of argue about which, what kind of mathematical equations you should use to define diversity. You can also talk about diversity in terms of the different jobs that are done or the different functions. So you can think about roles that are played on the ecosystem, grazers or scrapers or diggers or, or encrusters. You can think about numbers of different species. You can think about families of species. 
Um, you can argue about that academically for forever. But what we know overall, even with all of that arguing in the background, is that the more diverse a system is, the more it tends to be stable and resistant to, to being disrupted. So if you have a table that's only built on three legs, uh, you're in trouble when one of those legs comes out. But if you have a table that's built on 100 legs, things can change underneath, and the table will still, still stay up. Amazing. Good question. Definition uh, of diversity. There we go. It was what exactly is a diverse ecosystem. What is it? There you go. I think we, we got there. It's, a, sy a system that's got lots of different roles filled, lots of different players, lots of different functions, and lots of different robustness, resilience to stress. Well, very sadly, we've only got a few few minutes left, and I, I want to take us on to this uh, big question that's sort of come up, sort of in little pieces, sort of during our discussion. Is is what can we? There's a, there's a big sense coming from our audience online that you know the coral reef is in trouble, uh, and there's, these are schools all across the world, so they're not necessarily those you know schools with a sort of coral reef on the on on the sort of doorstep or backyard. Yeah, absolutely. What 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 can they do to to help conserve the coral reef for future generations? That's a great question. I've got I've got two answers to that. One of them is that. You can spend a lot of your day worrying about tiny, tiny decisions that you make. You can worry about a plastic bag or a paper bag. You can worry about you know, a straw or not a straw. But the biggest impact you have on the planet as a person is how you travel and how you live and what you eat. So one of the biggest ways that you can make an impact on the Earth is to pick an area of your life where you're going to make a big impact. So if you decide to be vegetarian, you can use I think you use 10 times less water, fuel, and land to feed yourself compared to somebody who eats meat. Or if you decide to ride your bike instead of driving, or you decide to take fewer trips in an airplane, you can make a huge difference in the amount of pollution that you contribute to in the world. So no matter where you are in the world, you can personally decide to reduce your footprint, and that helps corals and it helps every other ecosystem too, because it helps us stabilize the whole system, it helps us cool the planet down a little bit. The other thing that I like to tell people is if you don't feel like you necessarily uh, have a way to affect a coral reef from where you live or even make a change that affects the environment, another important thing to do is do your job absolutely as best as you can. Because if you're doing poverty alleviation or if you're doing medical research or if you're doing really good education, if you're teaching people how to run a business so that they can make a community more profitable, all of those things help give us more resources to do, to get rid of the mosquito that's in my face, <laughs> give us more resources to do good conservation and to protect the ocean. So the, the I mean, the, the good thing is whatever you do in your life that improves your community, you're helping us improve our community by, by helping take care of humankind and the earth as a whole. Wow. So what I picked <laughs> up from that is... No pressure. Is, Becoming a vegetarian is it seems like a bit of a, a no brainer. Or, it's a, it or, makes or, a big or impact. Or a vegetable based diet. I mean, I think I've seen lots of papers coming out in the past sort of six months of saying the biggest single thing that you can do is, is switch to a vegetable based diet. Biking, not most biking, bicycling, pedal. Oh, yeah. Biking. <laughs> um, yeah, tr being smart about your transportation, being, being taking the bus, taking the subway. And, and, and having part of your life as caring and building a community. Take care of a community and do something that's t that constructs. Do be a builder in your job, whatever job you you choose to do. Well, that's um, amazing, amazing advice going out to our classes. Thank you so so much uh, for being part of Coral Live. Thank um, you guys for all the awesome questions. Yeah, These were great questions. Having you, we're we're back on in 45 minutes. Uh, with an Ask Me Anything session. Um, so do send in, I know we've had about 30 questions come in uh, over um, pre-submitted, and but do get onto the live chat and, and uh, get ready to ask us anything. Uh, that's Ellie and me hosting that. Uh, and then this afternoon, we're back on with a um, incredible edible polyp um, around lunchtime. I think I get, I get, I had one for breakfast, I get one for lunch, um, which is fantastic. Um, <laughs> Kristen, you're, you're back with us um, this afternoon as well to, to answer more questions. This is especially for our, our North American audience. 
uh, and then we finish off uh, today with another Ask Me Anything session. So thank you so much uh, for being part of Coral Life. Thank you, Kristen, and we'll see you later. Bye -bye. Thanks, guys.